They say you should never meet your heroes. It'll either be awkward or they'll just let you down. But I say, bugger that. Hi, I'm Matt Stewart, and in this series, I'm going to be meeting some of my childhood idols, including musicians, comedians, and sports people. For this episode, I sat down and spoke with one of the all-time legends of Australian comedy, Mr. Anthony Morgan. Thank you so much for joining us, Anthony Morgan. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for asking. I can't, be I can't believe you're here or there um, talking to me. No, have you not been? You've been doing this sort of thing for a long time, haven't you? This isn't, it's not, it's, it's not the uh, virus that has brought this technology to, the, to our, uh, I've always been doing this. Yeah, well, you live haven't in... A remote spot in country Tasmania, right? So I guess it's yes. a little more necessary. Yes. And you you built your own house? S yeah, Sue and I built it, yeah. You just packed up and left Melbourne uh, and went and built a house in a farm. There's a li Yeah, there's a little bit of time in between there where I packed up and left Melbourne and went to Tassie and uh, then just stood and faced south for a good long while. And you did this, I mean, this is probably, it sort of like blows a lot of people's mind, but you did this when you were one of the biggest comedians in Australia. You sort of just quit and moved to the country. I, well, I quit and I went away. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't affecting me very well, so I, I left. I, th I think I had to stop doing it. I, th I guess I thought I'd uh, I would die, which would be simple simple um, solution. Do you know what I mean? So you stop yeah. doing it and then you die. Well, that's fine. So I had no plans beyond that, and then I didn't die. Right. <laughs> so you had so, to come up with some more things to do, like build a house. Well, I had to I had to come to terms with myself a little bit. I think. Yeah. You know when I first saw you on TV, like this, yes. really. I was a kid in um, somewhere in the mid nineties and you were on the great debate. So back then there were two big Melbourne comedy festival TV specials, I think. One was the gala and one was the great debate. And the okay. debate was, it was real fun. I don't know if you have much recollection of that. I think you did three or four of them. And I can't remember which one it was. Yeah, I did a bunch. I can't remember because, I, yeah, I did a, yeah, I did a bunch of them, but I can't remember. It was like ideas get uh, sort of uh, seconded, and it's it's this exactly the same show, but it's a different show sometimes. You know, I haven't been able to find any footage of it, but I remember it was enjoying it. Think it was real fun and, and funny, and then all of a sudden you came out and just sort of blew it all up, and it was. I don't know, it just made me feel uh, excited. I just remember being like, what the fuck is going on? Oh. In a good way. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I re well, I remember, I, re I remember one debate. The first one uh, Matthew Parkinson helped me with because he knew how to do those things. So he helped. I'd never done a debate before. So he helped me with the very first one I did with the structure and what to expect. And, but my favorite one I remembered, I drew a picture of everyone on my team who had very big penises and uh, including Judith, <laughs> Judith Lucy, I think was on our team. She had a big penis and everyone on the other team had a tiny, tiny <laughs> penis in my drawing. And that was my entire argument. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were normally, uh, the winner was decided by the crowd. I imagine you probably won every one you did. I've got no idea because you you either got paid or didn't get paid the same, whether you won or didn't win. All the, all the rest of it, apart from that drawing, is hazy. I think of you as the person who like um, opened my mind to comedy being good. And then about 20 years later, I did it. And I'm probably, I would say, have nothing in common with your performance style. You're exciting, funny, all those sort of things. Uh, but still, I, uh, I basically blame you for um, starting me on this path that I'm, I'm now on. Good. 
but your path started, it's a, you began in the 80s as a 20 year old, is that right? 70s. 70s? 78 or 79, I can't remember. Oh, and never done it before, never been on stage before and had no idea what, I had no idea how to do it or what to do and was shocking, was shocking for a long time. Right. But in the 70s, you would have been one of like, you know, there would have been under 100 comedians in Australia, wouldn't there, back then? Oh, maybe, yeah. But a lot of the old ones, the older ones were still alive. You know, Murray Fields was still working, still working at Tiki and John's in Melbourne. Yeah. Now and then, you know, show up and uh, Buster Fidesz was still going. They were good, they were good uh, old comics. And then uh, I think there was that 70s crop all in Melbourne. There was uh, uh, Quantock and uh, all of that crew from the, who, uh, you know, the blokes who became the Dodgy Brothers and all. Yeah, all that crew. standing in it and all that. Yes, yeah, all that mob. So they were yeah. around, but they they had their own venue and they and they performed there, and then got other people to perform there. And then there was the last laugh. I think started up, and he put a little room upstairs where you could try out stand up. You know, smaller, smaller. Not not so uh, involved theatrical cabaret sort of things, stand up and little you know cabaret. So that's where I learned. Very very patient, very very patient people in Collingwood. I read a story that in your first gig, your first spot, you were bombing pretty bad, and then someone heckled you, and you 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 got your best laugh by telling them to shut up. That was the first time I was ever on, and I, I was so terrible. But I was so I was just shaking like a leaf, and I was terrified. That's why. And this woman was laughing at how scared and shocking I was. Um, yeah, and she laughed at me, and I said, Sh "Shut up!" Like that it was the best I could manage, and every everyone laughed. And I thought, oh, I like that. That's right. good when everyone laughs. That's good. <laughs> the iconic ones you hear about are the jokes upstairs at the last stand. L last laugh, yeah. Last laugh, sorry. If, it was, if I could get my hands on a time machine, I reckon that's one of the places I'd visit. The late 70s, early 80s at, at the joke. Just like every, all the legends were there. Were they? Who's the legends? Oh, well, it's like uh, you and... Uh, uh, like the like Tony Martin and um, uh, Glenn Robbins, all those guys were there. I think is that not that's not right. Judith Lucy. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. I'd forgotten about all those people. <laughs> Who were you thinking of? Not just me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're the main one. I mean, I I was just trying to not uh, feel so vulnerable. Chris Windmill was uh, one of my favourites from there, and uh, Howard Stanley. Well, I guess my my I guess because if you didn't go on to have a TV career, then I, me and my generation missed out on those sort of acts, I guess. But Sh Shane Bourne was um, he showed up a little way into that, and uh, he was he was a um, eye opening performer for me he had a, a, a skill set i hadn't come across before and he was really really generous in uh share you know advising me and helping me along did he start out a bit before you uh oh yeah started, yeah 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 early 70s it's in his family his dad was a, was the king of the gold coast right that's an honor yeah absolutely i think Maybe your most infamous story is um, when you went over to Edinburgh for the Fringe and you're playing the Bear Pit, and which is, is like famously one of the roughest rooms in the world for comedy, or it used to be. I don't know if it's like, I don't think it's like that anymore, but it still exists. But someone, so it's a late night club during the, 
uh, Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, and you were on, and and they... it's and it's three, it's like three levels as I remember of audience around right. you. So there's some there, and then some up higher, and some up higher. I think that's right. Do you, you do you know that story I'm thinking of, or there, there's probably yeah. plenty of them. I was emceeing, and so I tried to impress on the audience that uh, because there was a, there was a little kid, there was like a ten year old kid or something, whose old man was making him do comedy. And then we were just, it was just people, like it was a showcase. So you promote your show. So people were trying to do that and some of them were struggling and it was really awful. So I tried to make a deal with the audience where they would be, save up all their awfulness for me because I didn't care. Yeah. And let's give these people a go. And so mostly that, that went all right. And then... Um, some boy there, as you can imagine, it's a university town, so a lot of English, young English men who've never been away from their mum and dad before are there and they're allowed to drink beer. So um, anyway, someone threw their pint glass at me, which was plastic, of course. It just landed on the stage. So I picked it up and I said, who threw this? And it, because they were little, little kids, really, one put his hand up. I said, where I come from, mate, if you're going to glass someone, you fucking do it properly like this and smashed it on my head. It was pla I'm thinking it's plastic. That'll be fine, you know, because the plastic is still sharp and I was like so full of energy trying to control these hundreds of drunk idiots um, that all blood just poured out of my head all down my face. So I just did the rest of the show like that, right, bleeding from the head. And um, I won some respect <laughs> from the audience. It it looked a lot worse than it was, but it was right. a, it was one of it was a great trick, and people had heard of me the next day. My I had a friend uh, when we were eighteen. He we were all drinking cans all day. He wasn't as smart as you. He he wasn't doing this for um, for any sort of workplace sort of benefit like you did. Ah, he was just drinking cans all day. Then we went to the pub that night, the Torquay pub, and all day he'd been crushing his cans on it. He'd finish his can, he'd crush it on his head, you know, like a real yes tough act. And he didn't. He figured he'd had so many to drink that he he didn't realise he'd moved on to drinking out of glass. So he had a bourbon and coke at the pub, and then smashed it. Went to crush the can on his head, but it was a glass. And same thing happened. It broke on his head, and he was he, an ambulance had to come and take him to the hospital because he um, he cut his cut his face open. Yeah, that's the difference between plastic and uh, glass. Yeah, it's one of the differences. Right. Yeah. There's more. There's like a molecular probably difference as well. I'd say. Oh yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of uh, yeah Den density, but uh, yeah, very much. I was uh, surface. Surface wound, uh, and uh, not going to the hospital and having someone who could be doing something better, treating someone for cancer, pull glass out of my head. That's yes. that wasn't happening. So th this show is about it's like maybe the most self indulgent show ever made. Uh, it's about me meeting my heroes. Do you, do you have heroes? Do you think of anyone as as a hero to you, or did you have any growing up? Um, I was very taken with um, Alan Ladd's character in uh, Shane, the movie. Shane, the movie. Shane, yeah. That's a great name for a film. I forget. I think his name was Shane. <laughs> right. That makes sense, I reckon. Anyway, he was a gunslinger who'd stopped and he helped some people out and then there were bad men in the town. And then uh, one day when they finished uprooting the tree or whatever it was that he was helping the homesteaders do and the the men had been bad up around their house so he put on his gunslinger gear and he went in and he killed all the bad men and then he had to leave because he was a bad man and he's your hero is that and you sort of live by that no 
No, not at all. But when I was a, there was a little kid in the movie as well, and he watched him. He sneaked down and watched him kill all the other men, and then watched him go away. And so the little kid was trying to figure out the moral, the moral uh, uh, logic of that of that what was going on. And uh, I guess maybe I was too. So maybe I was more like that little kid. Um, Lenny Bruce. How'd you come across Lenny Bruce? Uh, I guess just reading, reading it. Because it was the 60s, so he was the late 50s and 60s, and so it was sort of civil rights era. So if you read up about that, you, you come across him. And then somebody lent me a book, which is about all of the old American comics around that early 60s, late 50s, early 60s time. Just there were some absolute crackers of weirdos. And... Maybe uh, Lenny Bruce because of the what he did, and then obviously then uh, it all sort of came apart where uh, the, the legal troubles he had sort of overtook his they were overtook his brain. He had no time to be funny anymore. Um, and then you know, dr and then uh, drugs didn't do him any any help there. So he's like a flawed hero. But the, there's a fella called Lord Buckley you should look up. And he's done a few things. He did a thing about Jesus that sometimes gets played in. in he always talked in the hipster language of the of the of the Hepcats, and he did a thing about Jesus called the Naz, which is sometimes here. And he also had a song that he used to sing called His Majesty the Policeman. It's and it's just a weirdo Hepcat dressed like an English lord, called himself Lord Buckley. He used to go in the Hollywood Hills. He'd uh, rent like a big fake castle, you know, and him and a whole entourage of like 50 people would live there and take mescaline and have huge parties the whole time. And then when the rent was due, they'd just all do a runner. Do a runner from rent. That's fun. Yeah, from a big, from from a giant Hollywood Hills castle is hilarious. I've heard of the restaurant runner, the taxi runner, but the castle runner, I haven't heard of that before. Well, it's worth looking into. He also did a beautiful thing. A guy, I was in a little room, in a horrible room in a casino somewhere, and uh, the guy just heckled him and heckled him, wouldn't shut up, and he's putting him down, he still wouldn't shut up. And so Lord Buckley said, all right, pal, step outside and walks off the stage, gets the guy, they go outside. The whole show just stops for five or ten minutes and then Lord Buckley comes back in with the bleeding knuckles and a black eye, walks up on the stage and does the rest of his show. <laughs> I can see where you'd be, like some inspiration you'd take from him because... Uh... Yeah, you sort of like push the boundaries of what a normal performer would do. There's the story of you like uh, you didn't finish your show in time at the festival, so you took them outside and finished, took the audience outside and finished the show on the street. Yes. I mean, you didn't get a black eye from that, but it's the same sort of idea of sort of uh, not being constrained by the normal hour-long festival show. Yeah, although you, really you should write, I guess, a show that goes for an hour, shouldn't you? <laughs> instead, instead of not doing that, but that yeah, no, it's. I think I. It's a very. It can be a very constricting thing, stand-up comedy. So if you can, if you get a chance to move the boundaries, that's good. And I think I tried to do that, a bit, and I think maybe I did it a little bit. But then you, I mean, you also work right within the boundaries of super mainstream Australian comedy where you're in, you were sort of, you're in a household name, being on shows like Hey, Hey, It's Saturday and Denton and stuff like that. You were like, you were brought into these sort of normalish comedy shows to, um, but then you kind of broke their rules a bit as well. But I guess that was all, that, that's why they hired you, I suppose. I think so, yeah. But that, I mean, that was pretty much it. There was a point there where, um, there was an afternoon show or lunchtime show called The Mike Walsh Show and there was Hey Hey It's Saturday and that's about the only places you could go on television. 
you're struggling then to push yourself, you know? Right. You did a set on, uh, I watched recently, I've watched it a few times. It's one of the, for some reason, that you, there's not, there's just not that much of your stand up online. I guess you probably, did you record much of it? No. To video a show, you would have to nearly remove half the audience. You know, there was so clunky, big cameras, and then you'd get a VHS of it. Or maybe, no, you'd get a Betamax of it. I just thought, it, at the time, I was trying to do things for live comedy, and also Australian comedy wasn't really a, Australian stand-up wasn't a, 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 a uh, it wasn't what it is now, anyway. So we were trying to, there's a bunch of us trying to do Australian stand-up comedy that was inventive and push the boundaries and also make it a live experience for people. Well, yeah, I mean, it was like what we were talking about before. It doesn't, it doesn't really translate necessarily. And I think probably with your stuff more than anyone's, it's all about, that's why it works so well even on your live spots on like the Denton show because it was live or the debate, you know, it felt like you were pushing the boundaries of what was possible in a debate, but it felt live and exciting. Yeah. Still. Yeah. So I don't know, somehow you were able to make it work for that, but maybe if, you, if you're sitting down and watch an hour of your show, knowing that it's been all set up and taped, it probably just changes the whole thing straight away. I think I'm going to record something soon, or soon-ish, soon for me. Um, but I think it's what I was trying to do then, yeah, didn't even just the inclusion of, I guess you could do it now with cameras, but really the focus of the performance was on that particular audience that was there that night. What I was trying to do was make everyone in the audience feel like that night happened only in part because they personally were there. Like if they had not been there, that would have been a slightly different show. You know what I mean? So it was an experience. So it was something that everyone contributed to. The focus that I had then on the audience, I don't think that would have translated to watching it passively. Uh, you know, like later on on video, I don't think it would have translated. Maybe it would, I don't know. But the decision was made that given the size of the cameras uh, and the fact that it, it wasn't the focus of the performances, I wouldn't do that. But now I think I, maybe I will because what I do when I perform live now, I've noticed a particular thing. It happens. And so it's because it's partly because I think when, when I was young, it was uh, acceptable and even um, fun to have someone as overexcited and unpredictable as that on stage. But if I do that now, as an old man, um, people worry that there's something wrong with me or that maybe I'm, I'm having some sort of fit and they'll have to help me. <laughs> and so they, they get annoyed at that because they've, they've gone out and they don't want to have to stop enjoying themselves to help people. So Right. Do you think that as you get older, the audience trusts you less somehow, kind of? Uh, well, they don't know who I am, I guess, because of that... Um, because of that uh, break that I took, big break that I'm still having, I'm, I'm bringing you out somewhere. Okay, what great. I, oh, no, I don't think I can. Oh, yes, I can. Hang on. Pull that out. Is that the one? Yeah. What I did was I thought about that and I made myself can't really see. I just moved my head around like it would have got, gave, given me a better angle, um, which I realised was silly as soon as I did it. Uh, can you see here this in the yes. distance? That big mannequin thing? I built an eight foot tall version of me when I was <laughs> young. Right. So it's a gigantic um, automaton of me when I was young. And I'm going to do a show. I'm going to try him out shortly, see if he goes. 
um, maybe next month. And that'll do all the stuff that I used to do when I was young. And so people won't be upset about that. And then I'll do the second half. So that the automaton will be on stage by itself for the first half of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be, I'll be behind it, but it'll be doing the, the show. Uh, and it's been uh, it's been amusing trying to sort that out how that works. Never built one before. You've never built an eight foot automaton of yourself before. I know it sounds surprising. Yeah. <laughs> you know you're a busy man. Most people would have done it by now, but no. So talking about your spots on uh, one of my favourite ones that I read about. I haven't seen it, but you were uh, on the Denton show that he used to do. A, Andrew Denton used to do a live cross to you and you'd be anywhere. He wouldn't know where you'd be. One time you got a tattoo of Lenny Bruce on your back. Yes. On live TV, national TV. That's how innocent I was. That was early on. Um, I did that. I told them that idea, which they loved because for their reasons. But I thought to myself, I wonder if I can get a free ride in a plane and stay at a, at a hotel and get a tattoo out of this. So that was like me just milking all the perks that I could think of. And I, I was completely satisfied. I just thought, this is it. You've arrived. <laughs> but that's like, that's how, that's how stupid, naive, innocent I was. That was all I could think of to get. Like, Free plane ticket. Uh, and stay in a hotel. Another one you did was uh, you hit a golf ball off the top of the Rialto. Yes. Two of Melbourne's icons meeting in that moment. Amazing. I wish I could see it. I wish I was there. Anthony Morgan on the top of the Rialto Tower. Um, I was going to do it from the restaurant, but uh, it wasn't finished and it was a bit dull. And I don't think it span around. We went up on the roof and it was just perfect. Did you ever ever hear where the ball landed? I I wanted to do it. I thought I could hit it across. And the cameraman said, what about if I film the ball and then I pan up just as you're hitting it and then you don't hit the ball? <laughs> I said, that's even better. <laughs> yeah, right. That's even, I, that's even safer than my idea of me <laughs> hitting it on top of another building. In my head, I'm like, what was the 90s? How were you allowed to do that? <laughs> I just thought, I'm like, that's, a, that's great. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of glad to hear that um, uh, no one died or anything. Um, I imagine you wouldn't remember this at all, but the, I met you, I've met you twice before today. The first time was... I was in the queue to see your show at the Comedy Festival in 2014. I think it was at the Trades Hall. And there were, you, you were coming to the show and you noticed a couple of people, I think you were either friends with or you knew them from somewhere, and you were catching up with them, hugging and kissing and stuff before the show while we were all yep. lining up to get in. And then you looked up, you noticed me standing there awkwardly, uh, like a half a metre away. And you go, oh, I don't want to leave anyone out. And you came and you gave me a hug and you kissed me on the cheek. There you go. And, and I, I was trying to figure out when it was the other day, and I realised, not that this means all that much, but I feel like it was maybe a lucky kiss because later that week I won the Raw Comedy competition, which was in the town hall, main room, biggest gig I've ever played, and it was my 10th gig. But, um, but yeah. that was also... So I, I appreciate the, the lucky kiss you gave me, the kiss of life. Yep. But also... You, we, is it true that you were the first Aussie comedian to ever um, play the main hall at the town hall? Yes. And you were selling it out, 1,300-seater. I think I sold out the second two. I think there was a few for the first one. I did three shows there, three different shows. Because why would you do the same show? <laughs> I did three different one-hour shows there, and um, I think it was pretty good by the end. Yeah. But, it, like, see, so and, and that happens now, you know, there'll be a handful of acts that'll play that room each year maybe at the festival. Yeah. Um, 
but that, it was sort of unheard of at the time. They'd use it for only big lineup events and stuff, but never for one act that could sell out a room that size by themselves. But I think that's like, so I was on television, like you say, and I was probably on the radio then as well. So you just, you've got a name and the, the manager said we can do this, so we did it, you know. Something I um, found uh, interesting as well, uh, reading about you this week was you were the f so token is the big comedy co comedy company in Australia I guess management company and you were the first act for token yes yes they they had a good practice on me <laughs> so how, how did that come about I needed a hand with the uh, organizing things knowing what contracts looked like and all that and Kevin was just thinking about starting to do it. Kevin and Angus, Bill. So we just got together and did it. Started doing that. Yeah, right. And then it sort of ended up being now pretty much all the all the big TV stars in Australian comedy are, are pretty much all grouped together there with you. They all followed followed you there. Token are really good at it now. The idea that you should never meet your heroes, what do you think about it? Do you agree with that as an idea? Oh, uh, oh no, not really. I think it's a, um, I've met some of mine. Shane? <laughs> no, I never met him. <laughs> I didn't. I never met Lord Buckley. <laughs> no, I met some of my musical heroes and I met, we used to, because uh, my old man used to work with Kevin Murray, who's the captain of um, Fitzroy way back. We used to run out and uh, and uh, uh, say good day to him at the end of the matches. Your tattoos are sort of reminiscent of his a little bit as well. Yeah, he probably had more than me. I'm not going to hold my tattoos up. Um, and Gary Lazarus came to our house once. Gary Lazarus? He was a lion as well, was nope. he? Yeah, number 31. Gary Lazarus, great name. I think he ended up coaching uh, at uh, Mount Gambia Way. Nice spot there. Been seen that big pit they have. It's a beautiful pit. I, have, I haven't, no. you got to check Same out the yet. pit. So thanks, thanks so much for joining us and chatting. Uh, is it, I, I think the only reason they say you don't, shouldn't meet your heroes, I don't know if it's because... Your hero is going to let you down, if that's the fear, or if it is that you're going to regret how you've behaved, which is how I will feel about this chat, almost definitely. I'll be thinking about this and what I should have said and shouldn't have said. But you have to live with the recorded, with the recorded uh, uh, evidence, don't you? I can just walk away. Oh, yeah, no, for you. I imagine you'll never think about this again, but I will never think about anything else. No, no, I'd like to see the edited down and see if, I'd, lo I'd love to see if it looks any good. If it, if I, because it feels to me like I've talked for a long, long time and uh, very little of it has been interesting. No, I've loved, <laughs> I've loved it all. That's great, but you're not the target audience, I imagine. Well, I kind of think I am the target audience, <laughs> aren't I? This is just a con so that I can talk to you. I mean, I don't even know if there's tapes it in these cameras and they don't, I don't even think they have tape anymore. I guess you've even called you've called it that, haven't you? Like, give me money, give me money to talk to people. <laughs> Can't believe, I honestly was not ex was wasn't my idea. A friend's like, "Oh, Matt, you should do a show where you meet your heroes." I'm like, "Yeah, where are we getting money for that?" And then someone got some money. I'm like, "I can't believe this is really happening." Anyway, now I'm sitting here talking to you. It's all been very strange. Well, that's the way of the world, I guess. If you if you tried to do something straightforwardly it probably doesn't work but you've hit upon a great formula there just tell one of your friends a stupid idea and let them organize it all yeah i should i'm going to try more of it now yeah well thanks so much for joining me here uh you are a legend i'm so stoked to have gotten to talk to you uh i feel like i've learned a whole heap today that's okay you're welcome i can't imagine what it is but you're welcome Anyway, Anthony, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for asking. It was enjoyable.
Bless you. Uh, namaste. Thanks so much for tuning in. It was such an honor to have that chat. Uh, and if you want to see more of them, you can right here at Stupid Old Channel. Uh, they're available for your viewing pleasure. Why not also like and or subscribe? Uh, I'm not sure how that'll help you, but, and then if you, you hit that, hit that bell. It's another thing I've seen people say. Something like that anyway, so. Um, is this kind of all you wanted me to say? Yeah, that's it. Can we do another take?